Hello everyone, uh, welcome to my first research video. My name is Li Bei. I'm a third year PhD student in Singapore Geophysics Project, and my supervisor is Dr. Yuan Yue Elita. Uh, our group is under the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering in National University of Singapore. So uh, my research is mainly about seismic attenuation, and I have done some work related to attenuation interface imaging uh, in the past years of my candidature. And starting from this year, February, I started to incorporate neural network into my research problem. So uh, today I want to share with you some of my uh, current stage outcomes related to the topic of uh, attenuation estimation and compensation based on the neural network. So let's get started. First of all, some very basic introduction about my general research field, which is called seismic exploration. So what is seismic exploration? Basically, um, seismic exploration is an exploration technique for underground resources, mainly oil and gas reservoirs. It contains three major aspects, data acquisition, processing, and interpretation. For acquisition, basically, we activate an artificial source to generate elastic waves traveling through the subsurface and finally returning to the surface and being recorded by our receivers. And uh, these recorded wave signal or Waveforms naturally brings back the subsurface physical information, such as PNS velocities and uh, rock densities, uh, and so on. So these informations can be obtained by feeding the re record through this uh, complicated data processing workflow, and then the processed information will be interpreted by the geologist for identifying and characterizing the underground oil and gas reservoirs. So to my research topic, uh, what is seismic intrinsic attenuation? Uh, basically, the intrinsic attenuation is also one type of the subsurface physical information that we are interested in. It indicates the kinematic energy loss to heat during wave propagation because of some wave-induced green boundary friction and pore fluid flow. The intrinsic attenuation is generally quantified by this parameter called quad factor, or Q, which is inversely proportional to the attenuation rate. So that is saying, for most background area, the Q value is high and the attenuation rate is low. But for certain area, the Q value is abnormally low, causing high attenuation. So at the surface, the recorded waveform will show significant amplitude decay and phase distortion uh, in comparison with the uh, source wavelet. Because the wave path has traveled through this low Q anomaly area. To quantify such cumulative attenuation directly shown in the data domain, we have utilized this parameter called attenuated travel time, which is defined as the integration of 1 over Q along certain wave path like this one. The reason we are interested in the low Q anomaly is because they are normally related to high gas saturation, and we all know that Natural gas is now one of the most important fossil fuel nowadays. Uh, in fact, more than 80% of the electricity uh, generated by Singapore is actually obtained by burning natural gas. Uh, next, we will use a movie to show how this low-Q anomaly will impact on your oil field. So you can see the red star indicating source and the green triangles are the receivers. The left the, the left-hand side is showing the non-attenuated case, while the right-hand side is showing the attenuation case. So we can see for the background Q, which is 1000 in comparison with the non-attenuation case, which is infinity Q, there are basically no difference because it's nearly no attenuation. However, if we compare the wavefront that have traveled through the low Q anomaly, we can see very obvious difference here and here. So we have seen the impact of the low Q anomaly caused on the wheel field. To further validate this effect, we have checked this trace uh, re recorded at this receiver. So we can see there are some subtle difference at the early travel time. When the travel time becomes larger, the attenuation effect has become more and more obvious. So we can see there are obvious some uh, high frequency loss and also some phase distortion in the attenuated wheel form. Now we have known the attenuation can cause phase distortion and amplitude decay for the recorded waveform. Then what is the difficulty of determining the attenuation in the data domain? One of the major difficulty 
is the ambiguity between reflectivity and attenuation. Here, we use a simple convolution example to illustrate. Uh, now we have a source wavelet like this, and it can involve a reflectivity like this. With no attenuation, the obtained recorded waveform will be like this. If the source wavelet involves still this reflectivity, but with this much of attenuation, then the recorded waveform will be like this. It is obviously attenuated. But if the source wavelet is involving a reflectivity like this, but with no attenuation, the obtained recorded waveform is actually the same as the second case. So you can imagine if we want to use the recorded waveform to compare with the source wavelet, try to estimate the attenuation, then we will get some ambiguity between the third and the second cases. In fact, the third case reflectivity, people may refer it as the scattering queue. Conventional queue estimation method, basically, it's impossible to differentiate such scattering queue from the intrinsic queue. Well, this mighty neural network, which have been successfully utilized in many different areas, can help with, with this issue? And my answer is yes. So a straightforward idea would be inputting the recorded waveform through a neural network, and the output will be the estimated attenuated travel time, or psi. Uh, however, in order to obtain the attenuation, the recorded waveform must be compared with some unattenuated waveform, because the attenuation is always a relative concept. So we may add another output as the unattenuated waveform. Therefore, we desire a neural network that could perform not only attenuation estimation, but also compensation simultaneously, because these two processes are constraining each other. As for the ambiguity, we can use training data set to teach the neural network to choose from the ambiguous situations. For example, if our training data was the label of this, then um, the neural network will adapt to the sparse uh, reflectivity situation. However, if the label is zero instead, then the neural network will be suitable for such scattering Q reflectivity situation. So the input and output for our neural network will be like this. Basically, we input the recorded waveform, which is the viscoacoustic seismogram, and then it outputs the estimated attenuated travel time, and correspondingly the compensated acoustic seismogram. The three of them are all defined in the zero offset domain, because in the zero offset domain, the horizontal continuity is much better. However, such complete zero offset domain seismograms sometimes may contain hundreds of traces uh, with thousands of samples within each trace. So in order to reduce the computational cost and memory cost during training and utilizing of the neural network, we choose to work with small patches like this. Uh, the structure of the neural network will be the unit. We can see from RV to RA, this is a typical unit problem because RA and RV are quite similar to each other. Because the process of compensation uh, must have figured out the attenuation somehow along the way, we concatenated features on both up and down sides to form a new upwards side for the uh, psi estimation like this. So we also notice that instead of estimating psi patch, we are using three fully connected layers to regress this patch into a scalar which is defined as the mean of the psi patch. This is because the influence of the size variation within the patch does not influence much on RV. So estimating the mean psi will be more robust and easy to train. So now we have the neural network. The next question will be how to obtain the large amount of training data with reliable labels. There will be basically two options. Option one is that we can use the real data set in which the attenuation estimation and compensation have been done properly. So the advantage of this option is the real data set can represent the real situation, like the reflectivity and so on. But the disadvantage is that the reliable estimation of attenuation is hard to achieve or even validate. On the contrary, option two is to numerically synthesize corresponding RA, RV, and psi then the inputs and outputs are always analytically corresponding to each other. 
So it guarantees the labels are always correct. Additionally, the efficiency of generating data patches like this can be very high. Like in this study, we are using simple filtering to achieve fast generation of training patches. The bad things for option two is that in order to generate a suitable training data set that resembles the real recorded waveforms, we have to know some prior knowledge. For example, the source wavelet and uh, reflectivity information in your recorded waveform. Like we mentioned, we synthesized the training data by using this forward queue filtering process. So you can see it basically filter RA non-stationarily according to the filters based on psi, which gives us RV. So RA, RV, and the psi patches are corresponding to each other as the input and output of the neural network. Also notice RA is actually obtained by convolving the source wavelet and the reflectivity. Here we assume that the source wavelet can be derived from direct arrival and the reflectivity sequence can be obtained from well log in the working field. Now if we have derived the source wavelet and the reflectivity sequence from the well log, we can start from generating RA. Uh, first, we randomly slice a short period of the reflectivity, then convolve a source wavelet to obtain a small piece of waveform. Repeating this piece of waveform by several traces, we got a 2D patch like this. And to simulate the horizontal variation, we further dynamically scale and shift this patch and obtain RA like this. And uh, second, we designed the attenuated travel time patch simply by repeating the linearly increasing function, which is defined by the base level of attenuation size zero and the slope determined by an inverse Q. So finally, we perform this forward Q filtering using RA and psi to generate RV like this. The three patches generated this way now have provided a set of training data. By randomly selecting different pieces of reflectivity and use randomly different scale and shift here, we can generate infinite number of different RA. Similarly, by using different size zero and Q, we can also generate as many psi patches as possible. And the overall process is rather efficient since it is mainly based on filtering. And next, I will use a numerical example to illustrate the whole process and the test performance of our neural network. So you can see the velocity model looks like this, where many thin layers causing the closely, re closely located reflectivities, uh, which basically is the scattering Q situation. So the Q model contains two rectangular anomalies like this, and uh, the zero offset acoustic and viscoacoustic waveforms are simulated using case-based low rank decomposition method. We can visually see some attenuation effects in the viscoacoustic waveforms in comparison with the acoustic waveforms. For the test, we assume that we only know the viscoacoustic waveform along with the source wavelet uh, derived from the first arrival. And uh, also, we assume the availability of a reflectivity sequence derived from the well log. As we have introduced before, we can generate as many training patches as we want, starting from the source wavelet and the reflectivity sequence. So in this example, we generate totally uh, 60,000 sets of RA, RV, and psi patches. Here we show four of them, whose psi labels equals to 0, 0.01, 0 0.02, and 0 0.03 like this. So you can see uh, the first column shown here are the attenuated travel time patches, and the psi label should be the mean of these psi patches, as we have introduced before. So the second and third columns displays RA and RV patches respectively, and the fourth column are the middle choice comparison between RA and RV. And as for the test, we just slice many overlapping patches uh, from these three zero offset gathers. And we also select four typical patches with psi label around 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and 0 0.03. And uh, for each, uh, each column, and corresponding to the same order as we have introduced before in the uh, training data set. Here we show the update of predicted RA and psi across total 60 epochs. The last three columns are the updating predictions. So we can see 
eventually, the predictions are pretty much converged to their labels. And uh, the loss plot of the training objective function in log scale is are shown here. So we can see both RA fitting and the Psi fitting are pretty much converge very quickly. And we can see these two parts are actually where we have adjusted the learning rate to accelerate the convergence. Then we applied our well-trained neural network to the test data set. And the four selected patches, same as before, has some predictions. We can see, uh, although it's not as good as the uh, training data set, but still very acceptable, I think, for RA fitting and for the psi fitting. And uh, we also combine the patch psi estimation uh, and smooth the combined predictions. So the result uh, are shown in the right-hand side against the reference psi obtained from the accurate Q model. The smooth predictions uh, looks quite consistent with the reference. And we can also compare the left trace at the distance of uh, 70, 100 meters and the right trace at a distance of 5,000 meters. So you can see the attenuation estimation in 1D is also quite satisfied. Based on the attenuated travel time estimation in the data domain, we can also perform a running local linear regression process to invert for 1 over Q, uh, followed by a time to depth conversion. So the predicted Q model or 1 over Q model is obtained like this. Although the, the, the shape of the anomalies are a bit distorted, the position of the Q value and the Q anomaly uh, are, I think, very much uh, preserved. As for the compensation, we also compare the combined predicted RA uh, on the right-hand side with the reference RA on the left-hand side. It appears that the visual attenuation effects once appearing in the visco acoustic director now has been gone. And uh, we further compare the traces at a distance of 1,700 and uh, 5,000 meters. We can see that uh, the deeper part of the predicted RA uh, has been compensated to the same level of reference RA. And some conclusions. So first of all, the neural network is able to perform satisfying attenuation estimation and compensation simultaneously, given just the, uh, a small patch of the attenuated wolf. And secondly, the neural network can avoid Q estimation ambiguity caused by unknown reflectivity uh, since it adapts to the reflectivity characteristics provided in the training data set. And the third is, in order to generate such suitable training data set for a objective field data, source wavelet, and the reflectivity information from a value logging or other reliable sources are also necessary. And finally, the attenuation estimation from neural network can be used to infer the low Q anomaly with acceptable spatial resolution. Um, thank you for uh, watching this video to the end. And uh, if you are interested and have questions or suggestions to whatever I have talked and uh, showed in this video, please contact me through this uh, email. Uh, I will reply you as soon as possible. And uh, thanks again. That's all.